Germany lost all her colonies to the victors of World War I. Britain was free to tighten her grip on its colonial possessions with the newly appropriated territories. These new dominions were by this time more valuable as trading partners than as any kind of colonial asset. The British Empire was at its zenith. More parts of the world were in British control than ever before. By 1945, most of it would be gone. Airplanes were now essential to counter the tyranny of distance. The wartime evolution of reliable air France made this possible. The Royal Air Force, created by amalgamating smaller services in the final years of the war, was the biggest air force in the world. Its planes and pilots served all over the colonies. Despite the improvements in aircraft design, such aircraft did not have the reliability that we would expect of aircraft today, especially since many of them had to operate in extreme conditions. Some of the pilots were as unreliable as the aircraft. The sand and extreme heat of North Africa and the Middle East was tough on these machines. When a mechanical fault could not be explained, the blame was placed on gremlins, who were apparently nasty little creatures responsible for sabotaging aircraft. Nobody knows for sure where this word came from. There are several theories, the most uh, probable explanation being a, that gremlin is a variation of goblin. Gremlin was attested by 1923 from RAF pilot slang in the Middle East and India. The first recorded use of Gremlin was in a poem published in a journal named Aeroplane on April 10th, 1929. It rose in popularity during the Second World War. RAF hurricane pilot and writer Roald Dahl is credited with transporting Gremlin from British English to American English after being posted to the United States. And then he wrote his uh, first children's book, Gremlins. Dahl was in the US on a posting to the British Security Coordination, or BSC. This organization's role was to uh, mobilize American public opinion and was secretly governed by the British Secret Intelligence Service, more commonly known as MI6. The BSC was very successful at gaining American public support for US involvement. The Germans ran a smaller program through its embassy. The BSC easily won the propaganda battle. Dahl's tenure there was brief and soon he, he soon left the service for reasons mysterious and disputed, characteristic of espionage work. The very name Hitler has become an English byword for evil and tyrant. He gave birth to expressions such as Hitlerite, Hitlerism and trumped up little Hitlerette. The name Hitler is, or was, no one uses it anymore for their name, an uncommon variant of the name uh, Heidler, Hitler, or Hudler. The variations in uh, orthography were accepted within the farming regions of Austria, from where his uh, forefathers originated. The Austrian registers in Vienna were evidently not too bothered about how their farming peasants spell their names. Hindenburg was first to refer to him as the Bohemian Corporal, this uh, nickname stuck and was used by several members of the military senior staff. Senior officers during the initial stages of the war also referred to him as carpet eater, as Hitler actually lay down and bit the carpet during one of his, one of his uh, frequent and violent tantrums. Churchill referred to him as Herr Schickelgruber. Heads will roll is an early Hitlerism. Hitler first used the phrase in 1923 to refer to what were referred to as the November criminals. This is a perceived notion that Germany did not really lose the First World War. Rather, Germany was stabbed in the back by political figures who agreed to surrender in order to seize power. Like all good conspiracy theories, the details are kept vague in order to prevent the facts debunking it. The spreading of such poisonous slander by the likes of Hitler and like-minded losers, malcontents, and embittered mean-spirited thugs contributed to the rise of Hitlerism and the ensuing tragedy that would unfold. In 1930, Hitler appeared in court to testify on behalf of three junior officers on a breach of discipline charge. These young officers, they, they had a disseminated material suggesting the army should not fire upon those engaged in a Nazi-led revolution. The judge asked whether Hitler was planning a violent overthrow of the government. Hitler said that he was not. Then the judge asked if he would uh, repudiate his 1923 statements, heads will roll in the sand, which he made a month prior to his uh, farcical Munich beer putsch. Hitler replied that there would be a National Socialist Court of Justice and went on to say, then the November 1918 revolution will be avenged and heads will roll. 
Hitler's doubling down on his uh, 1923 statement made headlines abroad, where um, the German phrase uh, Kopf, word and rollen, was translated and attested into English. Up until that time, senior officers believed that the Nazis, the officers chose to find reassurance in Hitler's words. Hitler, together with the old Prussian generals and the officer corps, all despised the Republic. The army wanted to see those connected with the 1918 surrender punished. Moreover, they wanted to maintain their power and influence. By the same token, Hitler understood that he could not take power without the approval of the military leaders, who had the power at any time to put Nazism to an end. As Hitler rose to power, the old Prussian militarists did nothing to stop him. Nazi was being used as a noun and adjective by 1930, which replaced the earlier name National Socialist. It originated in southern Germany by opponents of Hitler's National Socialist German Workers' Party, otherwise known by this time by the German initials NSDAP. Nazi was then a colloquial word to refer to a foolish person, and used as such by those who are opposed to Hitler's party in politics. Such usage was not a widespread use across Germany. The first English use was by our German Nazis in Britain and other Nazis abroad who used Nazi to describe themselves in English. This was probably out of convenience as the proper name of Hitler's party, the, um, it's just there on the screen, uh, is something of a mouthful for the average non-German speaker. The term wasn't widely used in Germany as a standard referent for the party or, and for the uh, Nazi movement until after the war. It was shortly after Hitler became Chancellor in 1933 that the Reichstag burned down. Five men were put on trial before the Supreme Court for the arson attacks. Marinus van der Lubbe, a Dutch-born man with learning difficulties, made a confession. He was executed the following year. The other four, all members of the Communist Party, were acquitted. Nonetheless, their leader, Ernst Torger, was re-arrested by the, um... Well, it's there on the screen again. Uh, storm Detachment, uh, commonly abbreviated to SA. They were known on the streets as the Brown Shirts. Torger's detainment was explained as, uh, in German as Schutzkopf, which means uh, protective custody. He remained in a concentration camp until the end of the war. The Nazis made wide use of this method of sham legality. Anyone the Nazis did not like, such as union leaders, clergy, agitators of any sort, were simply taken away and either killed or interned by the SA. Such duties were subsumed by the Gestapo once the SA leader, Ernst Röhm, was given a taste of, a, of his own sham legality. He was murdered during the Night of the Long Knives in July 1934. The protective custody euphemism was widely used up until around 1942, by which time Hitler had taken for himself true autocracy and dictatorship. He had power over the life and death of all Germans and occupied people. Anyone could uh, legally be killed, detained or tortured without legal recourse simply because Hitler said so. Uh, for example, in March 1944, Italian partisans killed 33 Germans and wounded 68. Hitler demanded that for every German killed, 10 Italians should die, and so it was done, with no means of judicial review. GI was first used in 1936 in reference to US military equipment. It is believed to have stood for government issue, but this has never been uh, adequately established. At this time, American soldiers were known colloquially as doughboys, from the now dated word doughty, meaning brave and persistent. Doughboy was at first supplemented and gradually phased out by and replaced by this new term GI, in reference to a regular enlisted soldier. The initials were first recorded in 1943. Nobody knows for sure why the term gradually uh, transferred from equipment to soldiers. Government issue gradually shifted to mean general infantry in popular parlance, GI, or uh, General Infantry, has never had any official or legal currency. The history of this highly colloquial term is hazy and much disputed. Different dictionaries and history books have given different explanations over the decades. No credible or verifiable word, or word origin theory has ever been put forward. The year 1936 saw the onset of the Spanish Civil War. The Spanish Republican government had been instituting social reforms to which are conservative segments of Spain, especially in the country areas, strongly opposed. The Great Depression took a huge toll on the Spanish economy. Public discontent created the right mix for civil unrest, which enabled a military coup. 
The uh, Spanish Army of Africa was airlifted by German Condor transport aircraft from Morocco into Spain to administer the coup d'etat, the first such mass movement of troops by aircraft in history. Airlift was first used to, in 1945 to refer to this kind of military transportation. Airlift as a noun was first used in 1949 in reference to the airlift in response to the Berlin blockade. Hitler and Mussolini recognised the Spanish government administered by their nationalists in November 1936. It was also the first war where civilians were targeted for mass bombing raids with a German aircraft bombing Madrid and Italian aircraft bombing Barcelona. Italy would send a total of 75,000 troops to assist the nationalists. They operated with a large degree of autonomy. Hitler cynically sought to prolong the conflict in order to keep Italy on side and pit the nationalist authorities against Britain and France. What ensued was a messy and deadly affair that Britain and French leaders wanted absolutely nothing to do with. The nationalist movement saw the rapid rise of General Francisco Franco, who would dominate Spain under his dictatorship into his, up until his death in 1975. The mass bombing of his fellow Spaniards occurred under his explicit approval. On the other side, the Republicans were backed by the Soviet Union, not yet an ally of the West. The British press labelled the conflict a proxy war. The extent to which it was actually a proxy war has been largely exaggerated. Soviet assistance paled in comparison to that of Germany and Italy. Most of the material assistance afforded to stop by Stalin occurred at the beginning stages of the war. It was uh, logistically more difficult to provide it, and Stalin's interest waned over the course of the conflict. Only about 3,000 Soviet personnel served in Spain for the duration of the war. The Republicans found themselves a government without an army. They had to start from scratch. The Republicans became very skilled at artistic propaganda, and various militias were raised and fought under various disparate groups under the Republican umbrella. Communists, socialists, trade unions, anarchists. Some of the artwork, comprising of extraordinary and innovative art avant-garde modernist and photomontage posters, featured in a 1937 Munich exhibition. The exhibition showcased various works the Nazis considered to be un-German, Jewish, communist, modern, or anything else interesting, original, naughty, or poorly understood by the Nazis. They labelled the works are entirely well, it's there on the screen. Um, so this German word, this means uh, degenerate art. The exhibition was extremely popular and it was besieged by visitors, while on the other hand, the lifeless and banal art that was approved of by the Nazis attracted few visitors. An incensed and embarrassed Joseph Goebbels soon shut down the degenerate art exhibition. Western idealists such as uh, George Orwell and Ernest Hemingway also joined the fight on behalf of the left-leaning Republicans and in opposition to the Nationalists, who were also a coalition of different conservative groups, the Catholic Church, Royalists and Fascists. The word fascist was attested in English in uh, 1921. This in first was in reference to a particular Italian political party, the Partito Nazionale Fascista, the uh, Nationalist Anti-Communist uh, Organization. Fascista in uh, Italian simply meant uh, organisation. And by the time of the Spanish Civil War, it was uh, Mussolini's fascist party that was in power and fighting alongside the nationalists. The Spanish nationalists uh, had a like-minded ideology, which was uh, opposed to communism and advocated an authoritarian nationalist agenda. The homogeneous political ide ideologies of the two groups began to be referred to as fascist. Expanding the term from a description of a single Italian political party to an adjective to describe such an um, authoritarian ideology. In October, a nationalist uh, general, Emilio Mola, came to reinforce the troops besieging Madrid with four columns of troops. Rumour had it that Mola had additional troops hiding in the city, a quinta coloma, or a fifth column. The phrase was first recorded in the New York Times article in the siege. The idea of troops allegedly hidden in the city intensified the already paranoid atmosphere of Madrid. They were already plagued by infighting, which would be their eventual downfall. Nonetheless, the disparate groups defending Madrid held out until the end of the war. The paranoia was exacerbated by Stalin's involvement. Stalin sent men and materials to support the Republicans, but very quickly became more concerned with killing Trotskyites within the Republicans rather than winning a war against the Nationalists. Many of the Soviet agents who performed the assassinations were themselves later murdered by a paranoid Stalin. In Stalin's mind, simply having been abroad 
was cause for suspicion. Hemingway published a play with the fifth column as its title in 1938. In his play, there are mentions of assassinations, sabotage, spying and sniping attributed to these uh, fifth columnists. It uh, concludes with the arrest of 300 of them. However, there's no evidence of the existence of any real live fifth columnists. The notion of such a column actually um, ever existing is almost certainly a fairy tale. The meaning of fifth column quickly shifted to refer to any enemy from within and was widely used during the Second World War. There had been a Japanese military presence in Beijing, then widely called Peking, by the Japanese in the West since the time of the Boxer Rebellions. They also occupied Manchuria and Korea. The Chinese nationalists and communists were vying for control. As Japanese encroachment intensified, the rival factions signed an agreement to fight the invaders. The world was shocked by the Japanese atrocities committed during the Nanking Massacre in December 1937. The nationalists, led by Chiang Kai-shek, resorted to desperate measures to thwart the rampaging Japanese. The tactic was called uh, Jiatsu in Chinese, apologies for the pronunciation, I have no idea, and was translated into English as Scorched Earth, in reference to a military strategy by 1937. The Chinese would destroy everything of potential use to the Japanese before a particular area was overrun. Such measures um, reached their peak in June 1938, when the Yellow River Dam was destroyed. Uh, flooding the lowlands and killing an estimated 800,000 people in the process. Hundreds of thousands of Japanese troops would be employed in China for the duration of the war. The Japanese massacred 60,000 Chinese in Nanking, uh, modern-day Nanjing. The vastness of China could not be fully conquered by the Japanese military, who were bogged down in agonizing, endless maneuvers. Set-piece battles were rare, and territorial conquests were strategically useless. The war was fought with our guerrilla tactics and systematic brutality. An estimated 15 million Chinese perished as a result of the Second World War. Japan renounced its adherence to the Washington Naval Treaty in 1936, which mandated a limitation of naval force buildup, particularly battleships. Japan's withdrawal effectively ended the treaty, and battleship production commenced without restriction. In order to describe this buildup of naval forces, escalation, a back formation of the verb escalate, which then meant riding up an escalator, was used to refer to this kind of arms race. It was not yet clear that the battleship would not play a major role in the ensuing conflict. It was the aircraft carrier and its aircraft that would dominate the Pacific Ocean and determine who dominated this vast theatre of war. The Japanese invasion of French Indochina, present-day Vietnam, prompted the US government to step up existing trade restrictions. An oil embargo was slapped on Japan. As a nation with little natural resources, it heavily relied on oil imports. 80% of it uh, came from U the US and the Dutch East Indies, until this uh, abrupt cessation. The Japanese Navy alone was consuming 400 tonnes of oil per hour, with various uh, region-wide region campaigns. Although Japan had enough oil stockpiled for another year, their long-term plan for Asian hegemony was clearly threatened by this move. Public opinion towards notions of empire and conquest was whipped up, by the diplomat and general Hiroshi Oshima, who uh, initiated the catchphrase, don't miss the bus, to refer to the historic opportunism that would potentially see Japan dominate East Asia. Don't miss the bus was on the lips of, the, of a largely overconfident and jingoistic populace. After a period of intense negotiations between the two nations, with no resolution in sight, the Japanese chose war. The Japanese Navy attacked Pearl Harbor from its aircraft carriers on December 7, 1941, dragging the US into war, not only with Japan, but also with Germany.